Hey, what's going on, everybody? Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with American Canadian singer songwriter, record producer, and session musician Mark Jordan. In this newest episode, Mark talks about his newest album, Waiting for the Sun to Rise, what the best day of his life was, attraction to music, how he formed his way of songwriting, passion for painting, and more, as well as whether he sees himself as a recording artist first. And now, with that being said, hope you enjoy my conversation with Mark. Mark, hello. Thank you for joining me. Glad to be here. I mean, first and foremost, we have to talk about the Hall of Fame. Um, how did you feel in that moment? Um, what was going through your head before even, you know, heading into something that's been so, I guess, full circle, if that's the right word to use uh, for your whole career? And to know people are honoring you for the work that you've done over your, your longstanding career, what does it mean to you to to now have this uh, acknowledgement, I guess. Well, uh, listen, it's very gratifying and uh, do doesn't change much in your life, but it's it's nice to be acknowledged by your peers. And, uh, you know, uh, as a songwriter, you kind of work in isolation. So um, it's, it, it's really, uh, especially in the country that you live in, you know. Canada, and uh, so it's uh, wonderful. I was very honored, for sure. And um, I also want to to also mention that you sort of were, I guess, you you didn't necessarily, I guess, I don't know how to really describe this, but there was a question that was that that you were asked in an interview about um, how do you really identify yourself in in terms of do you do you believe you're a songwriter a songwriter first or do you believe you're a recording artist and you sort of mentioned how you always saw yourself as a recording artist uh in in the in the i guess in the forefront of things um why 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 do you believe that you you've, you've always had that vision of of being a recording artist rather than a songwriter oh, it, it it helps me write songs because i never and and maybe it's because I just don't have the skill, but I never write specifically for other people because in order to make the lyrics true, I can't imagine somebody else's life. I can't imagine, you know, how Rod Stewart gets through the day, but I can certainly imagine how Mark Jordan gets through the day. So two things, we're all human <laughs> and we all have certain similarities, but that's, but it stops there. And then people's lives are people's lives and people's audiences are people's audiences. So I, what I do is try to write about the things that connect all of us the basic things that connect all of us. And so I don't really want to be thinking about Rod or Dinah Ross or Joe Cocker or any of those people because I want to write about what's universal and, and, it, it, and, and connects him with me or her with me and not the minutia of someone's existence right and if you don't mind me asking what are some of those basic things that that, that you would that you were mentioning there in, in regards to like the songwriting aspect well um well there's, uh, you know initially there's love and there's hate there's betrayal there's there's uh children there's uh uh but in, in the other thing is people's worldview, I guess. And and I often write from a position, from a kind of um, philosophical position, political position. And that that is sort of that's the only you know, uh, constraints I put on myself. I mean, if I was writing for somebody and uh, 
I don't know. I, I, I couldn't, I could never say that, uh, you know, guns are great or, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I have, I, there are certain principles that I have that, that I, that I try to write about and, and, um, and so certain people record my stuff, and, but certain people would not, like, because there is there is sort of a political point of view. For sure. And, um, you know, I was also, like, just listening to, uh, I, I have just, I don't know, recently um, listened to the interview that you did with Rudy Blair um, at the Hughes Theater. Um, and I was, like, I was so captivated by by what you said about, um, you know, I guess your attraction to music because your your dad was a singer, um, yeah. and it was sort of the family business, um, sort of uh, aspect of it. But when you were sort of growing up, you didn't really have the intent of wanting to sing, or necessarily do music at all, um, because you know obviously for like young teenage, like people like myself and, and obviously, um, and you, you actually said that, you know, they don't want to know what their parents are doing. Um, and you didn't want to know, you know, I I guess putting this in, in broader perspective is, is saying that you thought it was in you and it was around it and you were around it all, all your life. And you tried university and didn't do very well there. Right. Um, and you drifted back into music every every time. But I guess what other elements played in sort of the, the, the factor um, in, in terms of your music career? Why did you feel that attraction to music in the first, first place? Well, it, uh, I was lucky to be born in a time that I could do music. In other words, if the only music around when I was growing up was classical music, I would have been out to lunch because I'm dyslexic. And um, it's very hard to read music for me. So to be blessed, uh, you know, in terms of... uh, Growing up, turning on the radio and not hearing Vivaldi, but hearing uh, Bob Dylan, <laughs> I was very lucky because I could do that with my eye shut. I mean, I, I'm not saying I could write a Bob Dylan lyric, but I could. I knew I could sing, and I knew I could play a guitar, and I knew I, I had a. I, I knew I had a gift for melody as well. For sure. And, you know, I I also remember sort of just hearing this thing where you sort of were, were reflecting on, on your 30 plus years of being in the business and doing music as, as a career. And you sort of were, were, were asked about, you know, why music and what was fascinating about music for you and and why did you want to get into music and you sort of mentioned how you you took it for granted at the beginning of of it all yeah. and um your daughter uh zoe sky jordan was doing music and you tried to press you, you you try to really instill in her to to not take it for granted um because when people i guess when people come into to a bar and and you you sit there and you play your music and and your content or whatever you want to call it and people listen to what you do but you don't know where things will will head it can it can go it can go north or it can go south um mm-hmm. in a very quick manner but yeah. why why was it that i guess what was the importance behind sort of inflecting that sort of advice into a, a young teenager, especially your, your daughter, um, to get her to be, I guess, tough because they, in the music business, you got to have tough skin and, and, and you got to really take criticism with a grain of salt, but not to take it personally, but to, yeah. I, I guess, take it as, as just a learning tool. Right. I mean, for sure. 
But that's why audiences are, are, are so important in the process of, as you're learning, you know, you can do, you can sit in your room, you know, for 10 years and write songs and then come out and play them for some people and, and they go, wow. And, uh, but if you, sit in front of people in a in a little club see when i was growing up there were all sorts of coffee houses and things that you could you could play you know with a, an acoustic guitar you could sit in a corner and you could play music while people drank coffee or had dinner or in all these hip little places but what i uh, what i picked up on was you know i play you know, I'd play a Bob Dylan song and then I'd play a Mark Jordan song. And I I learned to read the audience. And I, I, I learned to maybe feel whether what I was writing or, or a particular thing I was writing and singing was connecting. And you have to, so it's not just about you up there it's about them and you have to always remember that it's it's not about you it's about the people you're singing to and and, and you, you have to learn to feel whether it's happening for them or it's not and if it's not then you're doing something wrong because that's and, and this is, has nothing to do with money it has to do with communication and you want to the reason you're doing this is you want to communicate with people in a in a in a, in a way other than talking or writing uh, or you know prose or editorials you want to say something but if people if you're not saying it in a way that people resonate then you might as well not be saying it so you have to learn how the river gets from your hands to their hearts or their brains, right? You got to learn how to paddle down that river, or paddle up that river. And uh, so you got to be very present when you're in, in front of an audience. Of course. And, 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 you know, I was, um, there, there was this one quote that I heard from Lionel Richie that really stuck with me. And he's telling this to one young contestant and he was saying, you know, you can circle the pond, but one day you have to jump in the water. Um, and sort of, I guess that correlates what, with what we're talking about right now, but, you know, you have to feel what is happening to you and whether it's a positive thing or if it's a negative thing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I guess, also having that confidence of saying, okay, how do I handle this? Do I do I approve of what I'm doing? Do I think I can go far with what I'm using? Do I do I think people are relating to my story? How do I get that message across? And it's and I and I don't want to say this in sort of um in a negative way, but uh, in in terms of how we're I guess viewing this whole uh, subject of I guess um uh the visionary aspect, I guess, of of uh, of sending a message to an audience, I look at it as more of like a PSA. Like if you're if you're making a public service announcement, it's almost like you're basically trying to tell someone what you want to say, but doing it in a short form, sort of thirty second, ten second manner, because people are not going to stick around for five minutes and and want to find out what's your message. You have to get it across within the first few sentences of your of your song. And sort of, I guess the question I would ask you is, when was it, when when were you aware that you sort of had that sensation that you, you felt it and you knew what was happening to you in terms of your musical career? Um, well, I, I would say it, it, it's a gradual, it, it was a gradual thing and it's still, it's still going on. <laughs> in a way you know uh it, my, your career doesn't just happen maybe it does for a couple of people but 
it, it's it's it, it's a lifelong event that keeps in reinventing itself and unfolding and uh you have to um be very present uh, and you have to understand what's happening as it's happening and uh you have to make certain adjustments you know it's like a skier going down a hill uh so sometimes it's smooth sailing sometimes there are bumps sometimes there's a jump <laughs> and uh you got to sometimes there's a tree in the way so sometimes you got to you got to go around it and and if you want to get to the bottom or flip it around you want to get to the top <laughs> It's a bad analogy, skiing, but um, uh, you have to make these adjustments along the way. And, and you know what? Uh, there, but you don't want to overdo it either. Part of being an artist is being yourself, good or bad, and ugly. You know what I'm saying? So. Uh, there, there are people that are that, that read audiences like like they can see them like textbooks. I can't. I, I sense them, but there are a lot of people that see them far more um, clearly than I do, and they adjust what they do to their audiences now i do to a certain extent but i i i don't do it to the full extent for because sure maybe songwriting for me is about my own truth as well not just pleasing an audience for sure. And um, I, I also want to connect this to something that you said in an interview as well, that you you sort of mentioned how you were you were dyslexic, but you thought your problem with reading sort of were kind of, I guess, shaped the way you wrote. Um, totally. You know, when you would read a book, you know, you, you you sort of this is hilarious where you said that you would rarely read a book, uh, finish or finish a book. But it never really developed a sense of story with the beginning and middle and end, which I guess is similar to country music um, in, 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 a, in a large part, but your writing sort of became sort of vignettes as, as you would say um, mm -hmm. that you put together in some kind of, I guess what, what made a logic, I guess, in, in terms of that. Um but I guess talking about this whole sort of aspect of, of songwriting, when did it become clear that you, you sort of found your, your niche for songwriting? Because everyone has a different style and a different way of how, how they write music. Because some people read music in terms of the music notes it, itself. But some people pick up, you know, they pick up melody first, then they write the lyrics after. But some people write the lyrics first, then get the melody after. So can you sort of talk to me about your process behind that? Because I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Well, I don't differentiate too much between lyrics and melody because melody uh, is lyric. They're not different. You, melody is language and it's just an older language than words rhythm is language it's just older than melody so all those three things the the rhythm the the melody and the words have to be saying the same thing and uh often you young writers or not not as skilled writers don't understand that and they'll take um and and the melody will be not saying exactly 
what the words are saying. And that's like trying to paddle a canoe up up a river. Um, other great examples are, uh, you know, in the th 30s and 40s, you'd, you'd have pop songs, you know, like what we would call standards today. And then they would be wonderful standards. And then somebody, some band leader would come along and play that standard, but double the time and and kind of in a in a very kind of punctuated and flamboyant way. Well, it's not the same song because the the melody has lost its has been how do I put this? The melody as language has been disregarded. And so what you have is a in a, an arrangement, but not necessarily a song. Of course, and uh, with that being said, I want to talk about, um, I guess, your 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 passion for painting, um, and and I, I'm I'm curious about that because, a, it it seems as though I I love the way you sort of phrased painting and 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 music all together because you sort of called painting sort of flat music um um and i guess if i were to ask you why why was painting sort of um yeah i mean, I mean paintings like that i mean it it seems as though that you you I, I you love my paintings like like it 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 seems as though your paintings are sort of mostly instruments and and things you know but if you don't mind me asking was was painting sort of that that way of healing for you and in, in in times of in times of darkness in terms of your music and and your career as a whole was was it sort of the the cathartic thing for you to to paint stuff in order to, in order for you to escape those moments no it wasn't escape. It, well, it is sort of escape. It's a, it's just a different way of expressing the same thing. Not exactly the same thing. It's a, you know, you don't express. I mean, there's nothing like words and melody to express an idea. But paint, paintings do as well, and the style with which you paint is says something. But I. I always um, I don't know. I always saw paintings. I always was drawn to abstract because they <laughs> they made sense to my muddled brain. They made sense to my dyslexic brain. And um, so uh, to me, it's not much difference between a, a kind of very abstract painting and a, and a painting about a house. You know, it, it it it's not much. It's just how they're viewed. And uh, really, art is meant to be viewed. And everybody will have, especially if it has a, if it's a bit. Uh, abstract everybody will have a take on it right it's like jazz almost you know it, it, it's more like jazz in a way and uh and uh like uh, l things that look like photographs are more of that but i, I i'm uh it, the jazz aspect of it interests me for sure, and um, I w I want to now talk about um your 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 newest album, uh, waiting for the sun, um, it's it's a great album because I I love the I love the styles of jazz, um, and I love jazz music, and I love hearing sort of that, I guess that sort of cafe sort of style of music where you're where it's where it's very chill, where it's it's very relaxed, um. And so, one of my favorite songs on that album is "Best Day of uh, Best Day of My Life." Oh, um, right. Um, 
do you do you remember what the best day of your life was if you if you don't mind me asking <laughs> well it depends like looking back the best day of my life yeah i mean if you if you could go back to the archives i guess and 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 there and and take out i guess a memory that that was sort of the best day of your life well the best the best day of, i had three best days and the best day, the first best day was when I met my wife, Amy, in John Capex's backyard. The second one was when I held my first baby. And the third one was when I held my second baby. <laughs> and those were the, doesn't get better than that. Can you, can you tell me about sort of the, the idea behind Best Day of My Life and, and how did it sort of, what was the creation behind that song? Um, well, it's, it, it, it's kind of a mix of ideas. Um, it's about finding somebody and um, losing somebody and being cognizant of of the nature the, of the whimsical nature of connectivity and that something can just fleet by and you can you can think about that like there's a million things that happen in life that that um if you if you you can you can extrapolate on them and you know uh, um, a chance meeting and you and you can dream about what that could could have been or what that might have been like uh, like the, the 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 idea of serendipity in in one's life is uh is um is an area of endless possibility. You just have to dream. <laughs> you know, it's the it, it, it's the little it, it's that little thing that, it, that that catching someone's eye as you're getting on a bus, and then you think about that and and dream about that. And, not dream dream about it but you you think about it and and you can and if you you can go off on it like a like a like a charlie parker solo you know you can you can improvise and 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 that's that sort of bodybuilding for songwriters you know that's that's like working out <laughs> i love i love that here Honestly, I, I I love that analogy that like that, that that fits perfectly with um with with this with this whole album and I guess what what was it, what was the the premise behind this this entire collection of 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 songs because even though you've released re records like numerous records already in in your long standing career but what was the idea behind this new album uh, waiting for the sun to rise. Well, it wasn't one idea. It, it's it, it's a, a collection of songs at a certain time in my life. So they're all connected that way. They all they're all from a point of view, and they also uh, ha have tangentially a connection to the how should I put this to 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 the to the politics of now and to the way we get information now which is very different and how I got information a few years ago, you know, when I was middle aged, and so the connection between how we get information 
and how we act on that information is interesting to me. Very interesting to me. I'll give you an sure. I'll give you an example. When I was, was a young man and I was touring in Texas, I remember getting lost. I was on the on the bus with the band, and I think we were opening for Jimmy Buffett. And um, we get we got lost a few times, and we'd end up on these secondary roads through some unbelievably weird areas. And and you saw houses with Confederate flags and um, pictures of guns and, you know, and on the sides of their trucks. And, and it was very redneck, what you call redneck. I mean, that's a bad use of... It's a bad metaphor, but it, it, it's it was that kind of mentality, you know. It was, uh, but in those days, those people were isolated. There was a there was a house there, a house there, and then twenty miles away, another house maybe, and, or you know, these people weren't everywhere, but they were all, all dotting all over the country so now with the internet those people are all connected into one bigoted ignorant army of our fellow Americans and they have power and uh It's not a positive thing. It's not a positive thing. It's a negative thing. And, uh, but that's, that's information today, isn't it? Sure. And, uh, um, and, and, and I guess, uh, as, as we're running out of time, and I know you have to run, uh, very soon, but, um, it's it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to to speak with you and to explore um sort of your your whole career um and i guess in in just the short amount of time that we had what we that we had together um it's been an honor to be able to 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 know i guess the man behind um the songwriting and not the man behind the hits because i know a lot of people well, we'll interview you, and I and I know of, I've I've seen a lot of interviews where you sort of mention, you know, a lot of people may look at you as the as as just the hits, um, but you were sort of were 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 the guy behind the songwriting of those songs, yeah. um, and it's been an absolute pleasure, and and thank you for joining me on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you have a great. Uh... Your questions are very, very good, very provocative. Well, I mean, uh, it's it's just a pleasure to be able to to just speak with you and and just to pick your brain about the whole music business. Um, to the listeners who made it this far, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with American Canadian singer songwriter, record producer, and session musician Mark Jordan. You can reach Mark on his socials, but also on his website, markjordan.com. If you enjoy this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, feel free to share with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating or review. To catch all the latest from me, you can follow the show on all social media platforms. I've been your host, Jigmi Keltsang. Thanks for tuning into the show. Mm-hmm.